I'm excited about this word this morning. So if you've got your Bibles and your devices up, we are going to dive in. The title of this message is called The Lord Remembered. The Lord Remembered. And it's out of 1 Samuel. We will read the whole chapter this morning. Okay, so we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 27. And so we're going to look at a little bit of a brief history and an overview um, before we dive in. The book of Samuel begins at a critical time in Israel's history. Um, it was a time of transition between the judges and the kings. It was a period of disorganization and a lot of moral state was happening. If you go back and do some research here, coming from Judges into Samuel. In fact, the book of Judges um, immediately precedes 1 Samuel historically. And in the closing chapter, it ends with some horrific stories of the moral state of Israel. And the book ends with these prophetic words. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. And so then Samuel, the book of Samuel comes, and God is about to change all of that. And he's going to do that with Samuel. And so he uses Samuel to bring about a change. When you read about Samuel, Samuel was a prophet. He was a seer. He was a judge. He was a military leader. He was also someone who restored law and order and consistent worship back in the land. The life of Samuel was pivotal in Israel's history. He anointed the first two kings of Israel, and he was the last in the line of Israel's judges. And he was considered by many one of the greatest judges, and you can find that in the book of Acts 13, 20. Who was Samuel? Well, his name was God Heard. The life of Samuel was not only pivotal in the history, but the life of Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. He had a dedicated life to the Lord. But the book of Samuel doesn't begin with Samuel, not the first book. It actually begins with Hannah, which means favor, favored one, or grace. It begins with a husband in that time. You know, he could have two husbands. We, we don't do that today, you know. They shouldn't have been doing it back then. But Okay, so he has two wives, and it begins with a husband who had dividing affections. It begins with a woman in pain. It begins with a woman who was in suffering. A woman who was barren. A woman who prayed to cover her shame in her culture. In the culture in that day, when you weren't able to give birth, you were looked down upon. <laughs> a woman whose womb was closed by the Lord. A woman who was taunted by her rival. A woman who was a part of a plan that she didn't even know about. Hannah. And although this book is really, really loaded, and when you go back and you read chapter 1 in Samuel, I mean, it is loaded. It's got so much richness on the inside of it. And I'm not going to be able to unpack all of that this morning. But we will focus on what I like to call Hannah's model of prayer. She models. She has a model of prayer for us. And so we're going to look at that model and how God accomplished his purpose in and through her model and how this is key for our lives today. How prayer was the process to bring forth the promise. And so let's begin with reading. Are you ready? All right. Now, y'all know sometimes I don't get these names right, so I'm asking you for forgiveness ahead of time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was a man from 
Ram Ramathium, Zophium. In the hill country of Ephraim, his name was Elkanah, son of Jehorohim, son of Elu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives, the first named Hannah and the second Penina. Now I'm going to just give you a little bit of history really quick here. Hannah was the first wife, and most likely when you study the historical um, study of this, he married Penina because of Hannah's barrenness, because he loved his wife. But she was struggling with producing children, and back in that day, that was a big deal. And so we see that he marries a second wife. It says he had two wives, the first named Hannah and the second Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah was childless. This man would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of armies at Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there and they were the Lord's priests. Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to each of her sons and daughters. But he gave double portion to Hannah, for he loved her, even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. Year after year, when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way. Hmm. Hannah would weep and would not eat. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband Elkanah would say. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? On one occasion, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. The priest Eli was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple, deeply hurt. Hannah prayed to the Lord, and she wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me and give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. While she continued praying in the Lord's presence, Eli watched her mouth. <laughs> Hannah was praying silently, and though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli thought that she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Eli responded, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant the request you've made of him. May your servant find favor with you, she replied. And then Hannah went on her way, she ate, and no longer looked despondent. The next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship before the Lord. And afterward, they returned home to Ramah. Then Elkanah was intimate with his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah conceived <laughs> And gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, because she said, I requested him from the Lord. When Elkanah and all of his household went up to make the annual sacrifice and his vow offering to the Lord, 
Hannah did not go and explained to her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll take him to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. Her husband, Elkanah, replied, do what you think is best and stay here until you've weaned him. May the Lord confirm your word. So Hannah stayed there and she nursed her son until he was weaned. And when she had weaned him, she took him with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bull, half a bushel of flour, and a clay jar of wine. And though the boys were still young, she took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. My Lord, she said, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. Now, some of you might be like, now, what kind of Lord are you talking about? Back in that day, they used the word Lord when they were speaking of the priests. It's really kingdom terminology. And so to help you understand a lot of the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's really good to understand kingdom terms because it will help you have a greater insight and understanding of how scripture also reads. Also, if you learn from some of the Jewish rabbis, they teach good too because they have a different understanding of the word when it's broken down in the Hebrew and sometimes even in the Aramaic. She said, I prayed for this boy since the Lord gave me what I asked him for. <laughs> I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. Then he worshiped the Lord there. Now, before I get into something very valuable that Hannah teaches us about the model of prayer, I want to back up for a minute, and I want us to go back and look at verse 5 and verse 6. Now, I remember when I said earlier, sometimes when we read the Bible, when you're reading this, this is a literal story. This is real. This happened. Hannah was um, not able to conceive. The Bible doesn't record how long that was. We don't know if that was for 16 years or 18 years, but it was for a long time. Because she's watching Penina give birth to all of these children and she not have any children. But this is also not just about natural giving birth naturally to the promise of God. See, God had had a plan. She just didn't know she was a part of the plan. God had already had a plan for Samuel to come and to be in the earth. She was going to carry a prophet. And so God had already known, but she didn't know. And I want to show you something about this because this is really powerful even when it comes to our own lives. Sometimes God has a plan and you're not aware of the plan. <laughs> We're not always aware of his plan. She was, not, she was a woman of faith. She was a woman of God. But she wasn't clearly aware of the plan. Not fully. But I also want to look at this because it says God shut up her womb. What do you do when sometimes it looks like things are barren? Now I want you to shift gears here and I want you to think about you. What do you do sometimes when it looks like things are barren? Or maybe like God is not moving and you're having a hard time understanding the divine delays of God. See, the Lord always has a plan and a purpose, and it's not always in alignment with ours. You know how we are. We have a plan. We plan our way. And we can feel such anguish and such grief along the way, but I came to encourage you this morning. And I came to not only speak to those naturally who are longing to have babies, even those who are watching me online, not just to those who are naturally wanting to have babies, but those who have a spiritual womb. Hold on. God has a purpose. And a delay is not a denial. I said 
A delay is not a denial. Some of us are longing for and wanting to see revival break out all over the earth in a fresh new way. And we're seeing some of that, but we want more. Some of you are in anguish and crying out for people who are in your family that are not saved. And you are in anguish. And we'll talk about that. I mean, the woman was in so much anguish that the priest thought she was drunk. That's a different kind of weeping. I suppose she was holding herself and moving back and forth in such great anguish. But I came to encourage you to the mother whose son is lost. God has a plan. God has a plan. And I don't want you to lose hope. And I want to remind you that delay is not a denial. Hannah journeyed and the purpose of her womb was to bring forth a prophet. And we see that she is provoked and harassed by the adversary on the journey. It says that she was poked and prodded and she was harassed on the journey. You will always have an adversary present, whether it be internal or external, especially when you're carrying promise for the Father. You will have an adversary. And the adversary will come to poke and to prod and to harass and to bring anguish and to vex the soul. It's not uncommon. But I'm telling you this today so that you can know, so that you can prepare for the promise that you're carrying, whatever the promise is, whatever the plan is that he has for your life. Later in this story, we see that Hannah conceived and she bore three sons and two daughters, as you read beyond Samuel 1. But during all of this time, Hannah modeled something, body of Christ. She modeled something, and it stuck out to me in the scripture. Hannah modeled honest prayer earnest prayer, fervent prayer. She was then changed by prayer. And her prayer was answered. Let's look at honest prayer. Hannah models for us honest prayer. If you go back into the verse and you look at verse 9 and 10, it says, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah, Hannah stood up. And now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. And it says, in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept before the Lord. She shows us honest prayer. You know how it is sometimes we can go before the Lord and we, we mad or we're angry or we're bitter, or we're sorrowful, and we're not always honest. I want to say you get to have permission to be honest with the Lord. He, he knows anyway. We're not hiding anything from the Lord. We think we be hiding, but we ain't hiding nothing from the Lord. And so we see Hannah model very honest. She probably was like, Lord, What's the problem? What's wrong with me? Is there something wrong with me? I'm frustrated, Lord, and I'm angry, Lord. She modeled honest prayer. And so I want to say it's all right. Sometimes when you come before the Lord and it doesn't sound spiritual, <laughs> but it sounds raw, real, that's all right. So that's the first thing, is she was honest. 
She didn't try to come all put together. And Lord, I just want to pray and ask you, Lord, for no. She was honest. And there's something that happens to us when we can come transparent and raw before the Lord. And we can be honest. The second thing that she showed us was earnest prayer. Earnest prayer. Honest prayer and then earnest prayer. If we look at verse 11, it says, And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. She's earnestly petitioning the Lord. She's earnest in her prayer before the Lord. Then she was fervent. Hannah was fervent. As she kept praying to the Lord in verses 12 and 14, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and he said to her, how long are you going to keep getting drunk? Now I'm going to need you to get rid of your wine. And she's like, I'm not drunk. But she was fervently praying before the Lord. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to be fervent in your prayers and your petitions for whatever it is that you're believing the Lord for, for whatever the promise is that he's downloaded on the inside of you, that you pray, but you pray fervently. Jesus was in the garden and he prayed fervently. It's easy to give up in prayer when we don't always see the results yielded in the way in which we like. Oh, I'm not talking to nobody in here. I'm the only person. I'm the only one. Come on now. Come on. See, honest prayer, not honest talk. Am I the only one? Okay, just checking. And so I want to encourage you to be fervent in your prayer. Hannah was pray pray praying so fervently in her heart that her lips were not moving and no sound came out. Ever prayed like that? Oh, you know those prayers when you don't even have words to say. Yeah. You don't even have words to articulate. It's more groaning and weeping, but your heart, the Lord can hear you. So I also want to encourage you with that, that sometimes when we get in the presence of the Lord, we don't always have words to say. And that's all. The Lord knew her heart was praying. Her heart was speaking. Then after Hannah shows us honest prayer and earnest prayer and fervent prayer, the Bible says she was changed by her prayer. <laughs> it says, fourthly, that she was changed. Then she went her way and ate something. And her face was no longer downcast. So she's got honest prayer, earnest prayer, fervent prayer. And then it was being in his presence that it changed her and it fixed her countenance. It strengthened her to be able to go on. It strengthened her to be able to get up and to keep moving. That's the power of prayer. Prayer will resurrect dead things on the inside of you. Prayer shifts the atmosphere that you're in. Prayer is powerful. And it changed her countenance. She's under the antagonizing of the enemy. She's dealing with the pressures of the culture. She's dealing with the torment in her mind. And she turns to prayer. And it was there where her countenance changed. And it lifted. Yeah. 
it was there that she was strengthened. And she was able to get up. And then she was able to go. And she was able to live life while in the waiting. While holding on to the word of God, believing, not knowing yet that she's a part of the plan. But she had enough faith to believe that if I could just get there and pray. God had not answered her prayer yet. It says that she went her way and her face was no longer downcast. But God hadn't even answered the prayer yet. (laughs) See, you, you see, that's the power of being in his presence. He hadn't answered her yet. But it strengthened her enough to get up and to go on. She didn't even know that God was going to give her a son. Sometimes we don't know how God's going to give the promise. Sometimes we don't know how he's going to fulfill the promise. And yet her spirit was lifted from coming out of the presence of the Lord. Not because a friend told her it was going to be all right. And don't misunderstand me. I think you need to have friends who can pick you up when you fall down. It wasn't because her husband, you know, told her, I still love you in spite of. It wasn't because she was no longer being antagonized. It was because she had been with the Lord. And because she had been with the Lord and she had been in the presence of the Lord, she could gird herself back up and face life again. She was able to go her way, and her face was no longer downcast. And then the fifth and final lesson that I want you to learn about prayer this morning is that God's plan is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell him, it's bigger than you. Come on and turn to the next person and say, now it's bigger than you. Here we have God thousands upon thousands of years ago. He declared in the heavens and he prophesied that Samuel the prophet would come. And then here comes Hannah. She doesn't even know that the plan is this big. She's focused right here, right now on this minute situation. But he had a big plan and she was a part of the plan, but she didn't even know it. She wasn't even aware that there was a plan. Come on, tell the person again, it's bigger than you. Now that does, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that God's plan doesn't include you. It does. (laughs) It's that we are not the end all of God's plan. I said, we are not the end all of God's plans. God's plans are much bigger than you and me. So humble, we, we, that's a way we can humble ourselves. The plan is big and it's bigger than you and me. We get to be a part of the plan. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be a part of the plan. I just want to, I just want to pull up to the table, you know, and just let a sister get a seat. But his plan is often bigger than what we know. Now, this this last one is he answered the prayer. Now, some people would say that the prayer was going to always be answered. Some people would say that it it was a part of his plan all along. This is how it reads when you study it. Some, some, some people say, well, you know, it was a part of God's plan. But I think God was making Hannah, purifying Hannah, stretching Hannah, deepening Hannah while she was preparing herself for the plan. It's a big deal for her to give birth to something that the heavens had prophesied. We don't know if that time, if she was being purified, we don't know if she was being stretched, if she was being matured, we don't know. Doesn't give us all that detail. But sometimes he'll do that before he fulfills his plan for you and me. God has a purpose and God has a plan. And at times it may feel like 
And it may look like heaven is closed up on you. It may look like the Lord has closed up your womb. But like Hannah, we can demonstrate our faith through obedience even when it means an extreme personal sacrifice. The prayer was answered and she kept her word. She kept her word. Do you know how painful? I'm going to just keep it 100. I'm a mom. To believe God for years to have a baby. <laughs> And to be in so much anguish for so many years to believe God for the baby. And then he says, all right, I'm going to give you little Anthony. You know, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm let you have Anthony. I'm going to, you know, this is a part of my plan. You know, I got plans for Anthony. And then to give birth to Anthony and have to give him to the Lord. See, when you study the passage of scripture, she left him there. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to say something to you. I think, this is just what I think, so don't be getting on me saying, well, I don't know if that's the Bible. No, this is what I think. I'm saying it now. Just what I think. I think at some point along the journey, when she was standing there and the priest blessed her, I like to believe that when Hannah turned and walked away, the Lord began to minister to her about this baby. And I believe that Hannah was being prepared for the fact that she had to leave him there. So he could be trained and raised up as a priest. But that's difficult. But she, even out of the abundance of her heart, her mouth is speaking in prayer. And she's like, if you would just bless me, then I will. She doesn't even know that she's already pro prophesying. She's already speaking what was coming and what she was going to do. And then the time came and she didn't renege. Meaning she didn't pull back. And she didn't retreat. She kept her word. Be a people of your word. Had she had not kept her word, it would have disrupted the system. But she was a holy woman, a righteous woman, and she kept her word. This story teaches us many things, but it teaches us that God accomplishes his plan and his purposes and that we get to be a part of that when we properly align ourselves and we obey and we walk with him and we align our lives and our hearts and our minds and our thoughts with him. His promises are yes and amen. And at times you will be harassed and taunted and laughed at or told that it won't come to pass or you ain't enough or you this or you that. Yes, that's a part of it. But when God has a plan, his plan will come to pass. Let this story prophesy to you. He remembers. Eat the scroll. Eat the scroll. Eat the word. Get it down in the inside. Eat the scroll. Let it prophesy to you that God remembers. God remembers. He will perform it. God can handle it. Hannah turned to God in prayer during her time of need. She praised and thanked God even when he hadn't answered her prayer. <laughs> Praise him and thank him even when you haven't seen it yet. You waiting on your grandbaby? Praise and thank him now. Praise and thank him for the grandchildren now. Praise and thank him for loved ones coming in now. Praise and thank him for the breakthrough and the deliverance now. We don't wait until we praise him now. And she kept her commitment to the Lord, even though it was probably difficult. 
God blessed Hannah beyond what she could have asked for. Beyond what she could have asked for. Hannah's attitude of prayer and dependence on the Lord is a great example for us. Honest prayer. Earnest prayer. Fervent prayer. And then you will be changed by prayer. Rejoice and await the answered prayer. Honest prayer earnest prayer be fervent in your prayers and allow them to change you and then praise and worship him as you await the answered prayer God has a plan you are a part of his plan whether you understand the fullness of it or not God has a plan and he has a plan for your life Now, I want you to just turn to one person. We're just going to get two on two. And we're going to do this for five minutes. I want you to, to get, find someone next to you, and you're going to pray for them. They're going to pray for you. I want you to share what is something that you're either believing God for or that you know that the Lord has put in motion in your life. Or maybe you don't know but you feel anguish. And I want you to just share it briefly. So you each get three minutes, share, and then I want you to pray. Okay? And I want you to pray for them like you would want someone, like, you, like, like how you would pray for you. You know? Like how you would pray for you. Okay? Let's do that.
about one more minute begin to wrap up if you can begin to wrap up I thank you, Father, that you are strengthening your people today, reminding them that you have a plan, that you are a God of purpose, and that you are a God who answers prayer, even in the midst of adversity, even in the midst of it not looking like anything is going to become, you are a God who answers prayer. And so, Father God, we thank you that you are that God. And we can fix our eyes and we can fix our gaze upon you. I thank you, Lord, that you will give the supernatural strength that they need to be able to stand and be a part of your plan. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, whoever shared with you I want you to take that with you into prayer this week. <clears throat> you don't have to tell everybody, you know, what y'all talked about. But I want you to take it with you. Pray for your brother. Pray for your sister. Pray for them. Yeah. Pray for them. He is a God who answers prayer. And he is a God who has a plan. And we are a part of the plan. My prayer is that our eyes are opened to see the plan and to be okay being a part of the plan. Amen. It's not always easy. I know. <laughs> Y'all know I don't mind telling all myself. You know, sometimes it can be challenging. But God always has a plan. Now, before we go, I'm going to have Sue, um, Sue and Jenny come so they can share about our sister who has gone on to be with the Lord. Okay, um, we can do this. Um, a lot of you already know, but our little Miss Jenny that we prayed for and we praise the Lord for her return returned home to him on Wednesday morning um, we want to thank all of you that fed life to her for the last few years this has been a she was family and this family loved on her really good and for everybody Jenny would love to say thank you to everybody 
that spoke life to her, that helped her. My word is resourceful for Miss Jenny. Um, so we've been working on this, and we will do. I'm really hot, Curtis. You know that. Anyway, um, we don't have a date yet for a memorial service for her, but um, we've um, we're making arrangements for her, and we would love if when this happens, and it'll be in April, we haven't come up with a date yet. We have been in communication with her family and they have given us permission to do this. And um, it would be really, really important to us, to Jenny and to her family and for our church that when this happens, we would love to see you all here to celebrate who she was. As an individual, as a person, we want her family to know how much we loved her and how much we, um, we honored her in her uniqueness. You know, we don't always get a Jenny to love on. We were a chosen church. We were a chosen church to get the love on Jenny. And it was an honor. And it was a get to, to help take care of her. So I just, um, we kind of covered your prayers right now. As we're going through things, there may be some things we need help with. We'll reach out and let you know because we know you're all willing to do that. But I'm just saying thank you on behalf of Jenny because she loved it the last three weeks she was back. She was so excited to come back, you guys. You just, you saw it. So um, just thank you. And be with her family too. It, this is a hard transition for all of us right now, Lord. So, um, and on top of losing our other dear friend, Terry from Trace Diaz, this has been a long week for a lot of us. So we have been thankful too for the people who have reached out and prayed for us too. We appreciate it. I'm going to stay right there. Um, Although we know that she is with the Lord, but we will miss her and miss her being present with the body. She was such a delight and a worshiper and a worshiper. But I also want to take this time to pray for Sue and pray for Jenny because they have been so faithful and so consistent and diligent in helping take, taking care of her in ways that many of us know not of. And so as they, I know we will all have our times of grieving and grief looks different for different people. But I want to make sure that we're upholding these two in prayer because they were very close. And when I was talking to Jenny the other day on the phone, she said something that was so tender and that can be taken for granted sometimes in our lives. And she said, Jenny would text me every day. <laughs> And she goes, and it's different to not receive that. And so I would like for us to just come together as a body. We're going to just, I'm going to invite you to stand. And we're going to just all come down as a body. We're going to put our arms around one another. <clears throat> because we can grieve and grieve well and be healthy and grieve and be sad all at the same time. And I want us to pray. Here, I'll take that mic. Thank you, honey. And we're just going to pray for them. We're going to pray for the family. We're going to pray for our church. I didn't know the woman before who passed, but from what I understand, many of you did and you loved her. And so when you lose someone in the body of Christ, when you see them every week, it's not always easy. You don't have to know them personally. Jenny was family. She was our sister. 
And so I would like for us to pray. I don't know. Okay. Jeff is here. Is Charles here? Okay. I'm going to pass the mics to you all to start this first. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father. We've come. Father, we come as family. On this side of the veil, where our hearts are heavy. But Father, we just invite you into the situation right now. Holy Spirit, we just say come. We invite you as you we, to increase your presence here right now. And I just ask, Lord, that you would just come. Your word says, Heavenly Father, 2 Corinthians 1, you are the God of all comfort. So Holy Spirit, you are our comforter. So Lord, any hearts that are heavy, we just lift them up to you right now. We bring them to the throne. And we say, would you just touch and pour out that, that oil of anointing over anyone in this in this family right now of Lighthouse that is feeling a heaviness and just feeling, like, we're going to miss Jenny. We're going to miss her, Lord. We know she's dancing in glory. But we're going to miss her. I just ask for a special directed grace and touch over Jenny and over Sue for just their faithfulness, for their love, for their undying commitment. They just selflessly gave of their time. Would you just refresh and retouch them right now? Just bring your peace and your oil of comfort to them right now. Lord, we just invite this whole situation. We pray for their family, for Jenny's family. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to them, draw them near, Lord. You work in and through all things that happen. Lord, that that pebble is thrown into the middle of the pond, but there are ripple effects that are going out. So would you draw their hearts? Would you just have, I pray for the blessing of encounter to come to the members of her family. Anyone that else would have known her and had connection with her and saw the beauty that she was, would you draw their hearts, Lord? Would you gather them in? Touch them. We thank you, Father, for doing this in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to be with your daughter. She was truly a blessing to us all. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we do. We rejoice right now knowing that she's with you. But we just thank you that you continually will use her as a representative for your kingdom in this family, Lord. The example that she was for us and how she loved on us as we loved on her, Lord. That you will continue to use her spirit, her soul, and her body. And Lord, we bless, as Jeff said, over the family. We bless the family. Lord, we speak life over the family to know who you truly are. And we thank you for Jenny. We thank you, Lord for all that she's done. We lift her, her up. We thank you right now that she is with you home and rejoicing. No longer the, the worries of this world, but Lord, I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of knowing her and who she was and how, how blessed she was in our lives. So I thank you, Father. I thank you for uh, the Lighthouse family who continues to move on and know that one day we will be home with you as well. But Lord, we have, you have a plan for our lives. And so I thank you, Lord, as you use each and every one of us and you increase our gifts and our talents to move in your glory and your presence. And you'll bring forth the comfort that we need to move as we, we see our brothers and sisters who begin to leave us, Lord, but you continually increase us, our faith and our trust in you and in your word, which does not return void and it accomplishes what it was set forth to do in our lives. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. And we thank you for the assignments that you have for each and every one of us. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise. And we thank you for your peace, which surpasses all understanding being upon us given us the strength to move forward because we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength yes. and in you we, we, we trust in your word daily and we give you all the glory 
In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you are the God of comfort. And so I thank you that you come now to comfort the people here at Lighthouse. I thank you, Father, that your presence of comfort will flow in and through us and all around us. You are also the God of peace. And so I thank you, Jehovah Shalom, that you will rest, rule, and abide in our hearts and in our minds as we process our sister going home to be with you. And Father, I'm asking for supernatural strength for Sue and for Jenny. Will you strengthen them, Father, with a supernatural strength? And I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hear a song. Just stay here for just a moment. And it's about Jenny. <laughs> I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound, no more chains holding me, my soul is resting, it's such a blessing. Father, we thank you and we bless you. We honor you for your goodness. We know that you had a plan when Jenny was here. Her life was fulfilling the purpose and the plan in which you gave it. And we say thank you, Lord, that we were able to be a part of the plan of serving and being with her and loving her. And now, Father, I'm asking that you bless everyone here as they go home. I thank you for increased peace and increased comfort. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. You guys have a good afternoon. I'm going to have the prayer team come. And if anybody would like to have prayer, the prayer team will be down here for that.